Welcome to You Matter, a conversation series between boys and young men of color. Um, I'm super excited about tonight's conversation because tonight's conversation is about how spirituality um, and faith can sustain progress in communities of color as well as change life outcomes for boys and young men of color. And the reason why this particular conversation is necessary is because for those of you who understand the story of social justice, particularly in communities of color, you would know that the faith-based community has played a major role, in fact, an immeasurable role in a social justice platform. So again, I wanna welcome you to You Matter, a conversation series between boys and young men of color. I'm super excited about the panelists that we have on tonight. Uh, and so we will uh, first give you a background on MBK. And after we give a background on MBK, uh, we'll lead right into the introduction of our panelists. And after we do the introduction of our panelists, we'll go ahead and get into some bios. And after the bios, we'll go ahead and get into our conversation. So everyone who is here this evening and again, we welcome you. My name is James Green and I am the Chief Program Officer of MBK Baltimore. I also have the pleasure of serving as the Associate Director of Program Operations for the Center for African American Male Engagement through the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success without the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success tonight would not be possible. Um, and so I wanna thank Ms. Tisha Edwards, who is the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success. I also want to acknowledge the MBK Baltimore Advisory Board chaired by Mr. Mark Brody. I also want to acknowledge Mr. Phil Leaf of Johns Hopkins University who has given us permission to use his Zoom account this evening uh, to film as well as record and, and promote what's happening here tonight. And so for those of you who don't know, My Brother's Keeper is an initiative that was started by President Barack Obama during his administration in 2014, not very long after um, the murder of Trayvon Martin. And the premise was to ensure that boys and young men of color had a network of individuals, allies who were working on their behalf to change life outcomes. And so in 2015, Congressman, the late Congressman Elijah Cummings, the giant, the amazing man that he is, knew that he had to take up that charge in Baltimore. And so he led a coalition of individuals to establish an advisory board here in Baltimore. And uh, from 2015 to about 2019, they were trying to figure out exactly what they wanted to do. And in 2019, the Mayor's Office of Children and Family Success uh, decided to uh, take on the role of being the backbone, backbone organization. And so again, just want to acknowledge uh, Mayor Jack Young and his commitment to MBK. Um, and so with that, um, I want to move into the introduction of our amazing, 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 amazing panel that we have on this evening. Uh, the first of those individuals, I will, um, announce, and I won't even say the first of these individuals, I'll just give um, their bios and, and we'll go from there. The first is Pastor, uh, I should say Dr. Aaron Hanna, um, who through the marketplace touches lives of every facet. He takes the time to talk, laugh, share with, with and encourage individuals on a daily basis. And through these evangelical small talks, Pastor Hanna has been instrumental in the decisions of many to give their lives to God. This same love is weaved through his word ministry as lead pastor at South Church, which is in Cherry Hill. Pastor Hannah uh, earned his bachelor's of arts degree in pastoral ministries from the historic Enon Bible College, uh, the academic institution of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. In 2015, Dr. Hannah was also awarded an honorary doctorate of divinity through Enon College as well. Um, among his colleagues, Pastor Hannah is considered the happy teacher because of his pedagogy. Pastor Hannah uh, has launched two global strengthening arms, Global Joy and World Changers. Um, and through those ministries, uh, he is able to reach out uh, to individuals who generally uh, may not know God or generally may not walk into the traditional pathway of meeting God. 
uh, Pastor uh, Aaron Hanna, or also known as A.W. Hanna Sr., has been married to Lady Robin Hanna, who is affectionately known as Lady Cups for over 19 years. Um, from his union, he has two beautiful children, um, Aaron Jr. and Morgan Ashley. Uh, blessed with the favor of God, Pastor Hanna has been a successful entrepreneur, business owner, and operator for over 20 years, worship leader, pastor, friend, and Jalen's granddad. So I want to welcome you. Pastor Aaron Hanna uh, to our panel tonight. Thank you, James Green. We appreciate it. Glad to be here. Thank you for being here. I also would like to introduce to you all Pastor Michael Phillips. Pastor Michael Phillips is a senior pastor of Kingdom Life Church a non-denominational, non I apologize, congregation in Baltimore, Maryland. Under Pastor Philip's stewardship, Kingdom Life has grown into a thriving faith community, brimming with passion for social justice. Dedicated to revitalizing urban decay in West Baltimore and beyond, KLC, touch, KLC touches lives through more than 50 outreach ministries. From stocking food pantries to mentoring small business owners, their mission is simply to help people to live a better life. Leading by example, Pastor Phillips has become a champion for education reform. He currently serves on the Maryland State Board of Education and the Board of Green Street Academy. He is the chair and co-founder of Safe Leaders for Excellent Schools and the board chair of the nationwide education advocacy organization, 50CAN. Phillips is driving national dialogue, I apologize, on education reform because quality education is a moral obligation that our country cannot afford to ignore. Our third panelist is uh, Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III, a community organizer, social entrepreneur, base builder, and network weaver are all words that describe the work and expertise of Reverend Dr. Heber Brown III, senior pastor of Pleasant Hope Baptist Church in Baltimore, Maryland. For nearly two decades, Dr. Brown has been a catalyst for personal transformation and social change. He is the founding director of Arita Cross Freedom School, Based on the Freedom School of the 1960s, Dr. Brown works to reconnect Black youth to their African heritage while providing them hands-on learning opportunities to spark their creative genius and build vocational skills. He earned his bachelor's degree in psychology from Morgan State University, a master's of divinity from Virginia Union University and a doctorate of ministry degree from Wesley College, Wesley, I apologize, the theologic Jesus Christ, I can't get this out. Theological Seminary in Washington, D.C. Uh, Pastor Phillips, as well as uh, Dr. Brown, want to welcome you to the panel. Glad to be here. Thank you for having me. And I know that I know that Dr. Brown is, is, is moving in the community as he gets settled. He told me he was uh, transporting some produce, and I was going to get to that question in a moment because um, for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Brown is a black farmer and one of the uh, one of the organizations that he started called the black the black church food security network actually focuses on food insecurity in um, communities of color more particularly the black community so it's something that i want to get into because i feel like as we talk about how to space and spirituality sustain the progress of our communities um, as well as impact life outcomes for boys and young men of color that is something that we also need to discuss our fourth panelist um, is running a little late tonight, but will join us, is Dr. Kevin Daniels. Dr. Kevin Daniels is a native inner city Baltimorean and is a postdoctoral Harvard University fellow of the Leadership Institute. And, and you guys got to bear with me for this one, but I got to give them to you all. Um, he holds a doctoral degree in higher education from Morgan State University, a doctorate degree in theology and public health from United Theolo Theological Seminary, a master's of science degree in social work, uh, clinical counseling and administration from the University of Maryland at Baltimore, a bachelor's degree in science and social work from Morgan State University, and he holds a certificate of advanced studies in addiction counseling for John, from Johns Hopkins University. I just want to be clear. Yes, this one man yeah. has dedicated himself to being as thorough as he possibly can on every level. He is currently a tenured professor at Morgan State University School of Social Work, teaching, teaching across the Bachelor's in Social Work program, Master's in Social Work program, as well as the Doctoral Program for Psychology. He specializes in both clinical and community among urban populations. He's developed an entire curriculum for spirituality and religion and helping traditions in urban communities and organizations curriculum. 
Uh, he is currently this, the chair of the Civic Action Committee with the, ministerial, with the Minister's Conference in Baltimore. Um, and he was most recently appointed by the mayor and city council, Menzie Cohen, to oversee the mental health COVID-19 recovery in Baltimore City. Um, I could go on, but I'm going to pause it there and come back uh, because more than um, our pedigree, we're here to really talk about the work that we're doing. Um, and I know that these gentlemen who are with us tonight are workers. So I'm really, really excited about that. And I'm going to, um, Heber, I don't know if you're, if you're ready for me to come to you yet. So if, you, if you're ready for me to come to you, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this question. Uh, but if not, we'll move on to a question that I had uh, for somebody else who's on, um, and okay, I'll go ahead and shift. So right now, um, in our country, we have an election coming up. We know that we're dealing with um, we know that we're dealing with racism in a way that I think our country hasn't really been confronted with it in a long time, um, and we know that in this space we have these dissenting opinions that are shifting energy all over the place. And we know that many people are looking to our faith-based leaders for direction, for um, a centering thought around where they should be. And so the first thing that I wanna do is open up with you guys telling us mentally where you are, right, as faith-based leaders, and then um, really kind of giving us what you believe um, is going to progress us from a social justice lens, um, from a community development lens. And I don't want you to get too in depth because we're gonna go into this a little bit more later. But I think that these things are important when we talk about social justice and community development, specifically because um, those things mix. And so um, let's start there. So uh, Mike, I see you kind of you kind of ready to speak. So I'm, I'm gonna pass it off to you. Okay, I don't know what I did to make you uh, think I was ready, <laughs> but I'm going to jump right in. <laughs> I, I'll jump right in. Uh, where I'm at mentally, um, despite all of the chaos, uh, mentally, I see the chaos as a canvas. I, I see it as a great way to uh, reconstruct uh, what has needed to be reconstructed for a long time, uh, and that is the, the idea uh, that we are the United States of America and that all men are actually created equal regardless of their color, uh, their ethnicity, uh, their religion. Uh, and so I'm excited that we are in a position to have conversations about race in this country that we really needed to have, uh, despite the fact that uh, we're having to have some of those conversations against the backdrop of a lot of chaos. And so mentally, uh, it uh, puts my hand further to the plow to do the work that is necessary because there is inherent capital uh, within uh, the faith uh, realm. Uh, there's inherent capital uh, within our communities. And it is, uh, you know, really our obligation, our responsibility, and our duty as faith leaders to make sure we're investing that capital wisely within our communities to uplift it. Uh, and so I wanna just continue that work and I wanna do it more efficiently and more effectively and uh, leave legacy uh, more importantly so that that work continues beyond my own personal life. So that's where I am uh, mentally right now. I think that that's so important that you're talking about legacy. Um, I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Han. I'm not even gonna give too much to it. I just want you to kind of, you know, if you want to, you want to veggie back off of that, you can veggie back off of it. But I also want to know, you know, just for you, with all that's going on right now, um, what is it? What is it that you're feeling, um, and where is it that you feel like we need to go or be in this moment? Um, social media can kind of shift a lot of what you think um, when you think you're about ready to, to position yourself to handle a thing, then you see another thing and another thing. And when you think there is a slight level of progression um, within our community, then you see another thing and another thing. Um, and it's almost as if you can't get away from it. And not that a, that a person is trying to get to get away from it, but just when you feel there's a, a level of momentum, 
um, then you're faced with this hit again through media and it's like, ah, uh, you know, and you literally have to say to yourself, I have to use as a platform, um, this, this, the, it, it's the insecurity, the anguish, the revenge, the, um, the issues, the dilemmas, all those things you have to use as a footstool to modify your height, um, in this whole scenario. And for me, um, being, you know, grassroots basically, um, still in the trenches, still touching hands, still touching lives, still communicating and um, seeing firsthand how it affects everyone uh, personally. Um, it says to me, Aaron, you got to do something and you got to do more than what you're doing. And my biggest thing is, is making sure that when I do something that it is a smart move um, because there are people that are riding on our coattails, there are people that are assisting us to do um, and to be faith leaders inside of this demographic. And I want to make sure that when we're doing it, we are accurate. We're not just moving off the emotion, um, that we have an agenda, that we're just not moving, you know, ad hoc, but literally moving and functioning in such a manner that that it's going to bring change. And if it's not um, yearly change, if it's not monthly change, if it can just be daily change. And so I'm looking to try to do change in smaller increments to a larger perspective. So one of the things that I know about both of you, I'm waiting for Heber to come on. Just Heber, as soon as you're ready, if you come on video, I have a couple of questions for you as well. I wanted you to, to answer that one. Um, and, and, and Brother Isaiah um, just jumped on as well. I, if you're on, jump on video. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of ask you a couple of questions that I have for you as well. I asked uh, Brother Isaiah to, to jump on. Um, originally, I asked um, Student Minister uh, Carlos Muhammad from the Nation of Islam to jump on, but he was in Chicago uh, with Minister Farrakhan. And so um, with, with that, knowing that I wanted somebody to be represented um, here, I wanted Isaiah to come on. So Isaiah, there you go. Um, Isaiah, I'm gonna ask you the same question because while I know that you aren't the student minister um, at Muhammad Mosque number six, I know that you have an immense amount of responsibility um, that's given to you. And I know that you do a lot of mentoring. I know that you do a lot of active uh, movement in the community. So I just want to ask you, good brother, um, with what's going on right now? How are you feeling? Um, and what do you feel like we need to see? Um, and I just want you to go high level. You don't have to go in, in depth for me. What do you believe that we need to see at a high level as we go deeper into this conversation um, to progress us forward? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First and foremost, I want to thank you for the opportunity um, to represent our student minister, Brother Carlos, who's like you said, asking in Chicago. No, you know, I'm not going to complain. Even if I could complain, it's not going to do anything. Because I was, I heard a quote, you know, no matter what you're going through, it could always be much worse. Don't make a mistake, mistaking your blessings for a curse. So everything that we have that we complaining about, somebody would die to be in our shoes. Yeah. So I'm not going to complain to me personally. But I know with everything that's going on, we as men and men of God can't take God's hands out of what's going on right now because everything is already written. But what we have to do as men of God has to put aside these petty differences and these barriers that have been imposed on us and now that we impose on ourselves. I can't come up here and say, well, I'm a Muslim. I'm not going to get over on here with those Christians. I can't say, you know, you can't say I'm a Christian. I'm not going to get over here with that Muslim. We have to break down all of these barriers because it's one common cause, one common goal, and most importantly, one common God. So that's what we have to come to an understanding. And I believe that if we put those petty differences to the side, we can make some change. Because I wanted to share one story. I don't want to keep going, but it was a man that was drowning. And it was a Jew. It was a Christian and it was a Muslim. So the Jew threw out his rope. His rope was too short. The Muslim threw out his rope. The rope was too short. The Christian threw out his rope. The rope was too short. But then they looked at each other and they saw each other's ropes. They tied them together and then they threw that one rope and they was able to save that person that was drowning. So we know that we all can't do it just on our own. So we have to come together and bring our minds together, pool our resources, pool our ideas and do everything that we can to save our people because we, in fact, are drowning. So to me, you, you talked about a word that we talk about so often, we talk about collaboration, but I think that sometimes while we talk about it in theory, we sometimes miss it in practice. Mm. And so I think that 
um, I think that Mike, you kind of mentioned early on about um, even just the network of faith-based organizations, even before we got on to the broadcast, we talked about the network of faith-based organizations, um, not necessarily working together as though they should be. Um, what, what, what do you say to that? And then how do you believe um, that we move beyond, um, I, I guess, our, our differences, right? And move into a space where we can collaborate as Brother Isaiah mentioned a moment ago. Well, I, I think the first thing we have to recognize uh, that regardless of uh, the institution, regardless of the faith, that there is value there. I keep using this word capital. There, there is capital that contributes to the cultural wealth of our community. Um, the, the reason why there is a, a scarcity uh, of that capital is because uh, we wall it off. Okay, we cloister it and we hide within the walls of our institutions rather than uh, seeking one another's help and support, as the brother just stated. Uh, the, the way that we can get around that is first identifying that we're all watchmen on the wall at the end of the day, uh, particularly around our cities. And so uh, if we understand that common goal that we're trying to shore up our community, lift it up, raise it up, uh, and, and in particular, make sure that there's a pathway for the next generation to move us forward, um, then we would seek that level of collaboration. It is going to require, um, and I don't want to get too provocative, but it is going to require a sense of urgency. And more importantly, it is going to require a spirit of generosity. Mm -hmm. We cannot be selfish with our spiritual capital. We cannot be selfish with our, you know, relational um, you know, wealth. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to get outside of our little bubbles, boxes, and networks and see the bigger picture that we're all watchmen on this, at this particular community wall, right? And we want to make sure that our community can continue to be built up. And we can't do it forever. I don't want to be 80 holding on to, you know, my part of the wall when there's a, when there's a 40 year old that can go ahead and run with it or 20 year old that can go ahead and run with it. You understand? And the reason why we haven't been able to collaborate at that level is because we really uh, have been victim of, of selfishness uh, mm -hmm. rather than seeking the help and aid of other people and seeing uh, those people walking on the wall with us as compliments and not competition. All of these brothers on this call tonight are compliments to the ministry and the call that God has given me to my life. So we are co-laborers in this thing. And that's how I see them. And that's how we have to see each other. So Aaron, we, we talked a moment ago about, about building relationships, really, because I think that, that Mike talked about, we, we talked about collaboration, we talked about not being selfish. And one of the things that I've had the opportunity, and I spoke about this earlier, to see you do is build relationships with a generation that might not even really believe in God because they've seen for generations, they see cars, right? They see money, they see planes, they see suits, and they see all of this stuff. But in their mind, they don't see God. But right now we have a moment where young people are activated around social justice, right? Like you have people who are marching, you have people who are trying to find a direction with which to go in. And as I said a moment ago, for many years, the black church was the moral compass for social justice. How do we begin to bridge that divide between a generation who sees church sometimes, right? Because I know that isn't you, you, you all's church because I've had the opportunity to be at each, but how do we begin to bridge the divide between a generation that doesn't see God in that building, that doesn't see God in the man, right? But is, but is, is eager to advocate on the behalf of our communities to see progress come. They got faith, right? They might not call it religious faith, but they got faith. So how do we begin to see that, Aaron? I think one of the greatest things that we can ever do is make what we do visible. For a long time, you know, we just do the work and we just make it happen and we're not trying to put a camera out. We're not trying to put, you know, um, on social media. We're just doing the work, doing the work because it's almost been shunned upon to show the work that you do. Um, but the Bible says, let this light so shine that men may see 
your good work and glorify the father which is in heaven which is our god my thing is now um you know when there's all these things were going on with the social injustice people would inbox me and they asked me so pastor what is your stance what are you going to say and there's some persons that may not know my personal work as well as um dr phillips um what he's doing in his ministries housing all those things 50, 50 different ministries to make this thing go and function properly but many of us many people don't know and this generation wants to be able to see and um what they've seen prior to us has been cars homes and prosperity now understanding prosperity is a part of the gospel <laughs> it is a it is a functionality of the gospel um but at the same time we're going to need to be able to make ourselves visible for this generation because this this generation they show fights online um on youtube they uh they show dinners online they show they show hookah online i mean every insta store you see when i go through the hundred of persons that have joined the church since the pandemic when i go through their insta store it's nothing but hookah lashes food <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, and um, sweatshirts and stuff. You know, some t-shirts. And you know, and I I love the hustle. My thing is, is that they're showing everything. If they're in Bloomingdale, they're showing. If they're in Miami with a mask on during the COVID height, they're show they're showing all of these things. And you got to be able to make what you're doing visible because those persons will also, for whatever reason, they will also help you champion what you're doing. So, and, and you know. What we got to do now is I believe, James, in my clothes, is that we have to now show what we're doing or they're not going to know we're doing anything. Yeah. So, Brother Michael, I see you uh, with your hand raised. If you could put your uh, put your question in the chat. As soon as I ask, as soon as I ask my next question, I want to get to your question. I see you with your hand raised, but I want to get your question in the chat. I also at this time want to invite anybody else who's with us at the moment. Uh, to put your question in the chat, put your comment in the chat, feel free to be very active um, in the chat because all night I will be monitoring it, our team will be monitoring it, and we will surely take whatever it is that you put in the chat and we will bring that to the conversation. There's also a Q&A option where you can put a question in there and we will try to, to do our best to answer it there as well. Uh, so for those of you who have a question, who have a comment, please put it in the chat. We want to make sure that we get you involved um, in this conversation. Don't wait for that question. Don't wait for that moment. Put it in there right now. I'm looking for it. I don't see one. If I can just, what is it? If I can just get one, as y'all say in the pulpit on Sundays, if I can just get one <laughs> in the comments right now, uh, just go ahead and um, just go ahead and put it over there. If y'all don't know, I'm, I'm a jokester a little bit, but Brother Michael, I'm waiting for your question in the chat box. Um, there is, there is a uh, Bishop Kevin Daniels, I gotta, I gotta rename you here, so I'll get you over here, Dr. Daniels. Um, and one of the things that you talked about, Russ, was this, um, well, you talked about the culture, and I think that you and Michael both do a really, really good job of kind of, and what I'll say is making room for the culture without pandering to it, right? Um, Brother Isaiah, you do so much amazing work with our young people. Right. And I know that um, I can I can testify to the fact that you know how to infiltrate the culture and elevate the mind, both mentally and spiritually. How is it that that happens? How is it that you meet a brother who might be selling drugs, who might be walking down the wrong pathway and you you get the opportunity to get in his space, you infiltrate his space, you infiltrate the culture and you elevate his mind, you elevate his thinking to a place where he now believes in who God made him. Not, not, just, not just who he is, but he believes in who God made him. So if you could, man, touch on that for me real quick. Well, um, you know, I was speaking to a brother yesterday. He just got hired at our school. And I was telling him, there's three things you need working with this generation. Number one is patience. You gotta have a whole lot of patience because first and foremost, you gotta understand any behaviors that these children are showing is stemmed from something. So I was taught that if you wanna understand the nature of a thing, you would have to go back to the origin of a thing. And we always hear is that, you know, it takes a village to raise a child, but how much time do we take going to see that village? How much time do we take going to, excuse me, my daughter's in here, we, 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 we on our way making a move, but how, how much time do you, take going to see that village and then you have to have 
love. You gotta have love because you have to love them more than they hate themselves. Then you have to have a certain perception. You gotta see deep inside of them the God that is inside of them. Because I was taught, you can't never dump God down a person's throat. What you have to do is you have to feed the needy, give shelter to the ones that is homeless, and give clothes to the ones that need it, and then you teach them about who did it. That's how you let them know about God. So you have to be in contact with their culture, understand who they are, and then elevate them from that level and bring them up to your level. Man, that's so powerful. You, 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 talked, about, mm -hmm. you talked about elevating the mind. And I'm, I'm so excited to have Dr. Kevin Daniels on, Bishop Dr. Kevin Daniels. Um, and I can't wait till he come on the screen so y'all can see these, these Gucci glasses that he has on. I just want you guys to see the Gucci glasses because Dr. Hannah talked a moment ago about the fact that prosperity is a part of ministry and, and he looks very prosperous, if I might say so myself. But either way, <laughs> <laughs> either way. Y'all uh, cool. just got on. See? <laughs> Y'all got with me. Y'all just got a clip. <laughs> so, as our as our as our, our resident expert on mental health, right? For so long, churches of color really didn't believe in mental health, right? You were supposed to pray it away. You were supposed to go seek God, and that was supposed to be the end all be all. We didn't really deal in mental health diagnoses, right? We didn't really deal in trauma. We weren't trauma responsive as it related to our ministry. And one of the things that I know is that the pastors who are on tonight do believe in trauma. They do believe in mental health, right? What, what do you believe that from a, from, a, from a spirituality and a faith-based standpoint, what role does spirituality, faith, and mental health, how, how do they work together? Well, I mean, again, we, we, they, uh, we, we're in the climate now where, um, you know, just being uh, trauma-informed, um, and trauma responsive um, is not enough. Uh, we need to, a lot of us have known that it's one thing when you start understanding what your wounds are, um, but we are not supposed to be stagnated in wounds. Um, we need to move beyond just trauma-based focus, and we need to move on to what we call healing-centered engagement, um, where we start doing the actual work um, of liberating ourselves from those wounds um, that have gone on, not only historically, uh, sociologically, um, they've gone on uh, physiologically, they've gone on psychologically as well. And um, we have to be very honest and say, some of it has been religious as well, because when we look down through the years, some of this, uh, some religious perspectives have impeded um, our progress um, to some extent, um, because particularly in this particular country, um, I just left a, a group of young people, forgive me, that's why I'm late. Um, and the class is spirituality, religion, uh, and critical thinking. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's about 40 of them in the class. All of them said, I believe in God, but I don't believe in the institutions um, that, are, that have promoted God because they have left me with no access to higher levels of thinking and mm -hmm. high levels of coping. Um, so again, and that is, I've been teaching this course now for 10 years. In every class, um, they say the same thing, that they are looking for faith institutions uh, to no longer, and again, I'm not saying that all faith institutions are doing this, because I know that the brothers that are on um, this line, I've worked with them personally, so I'm very clear. But we can no longer, we can no longer um, 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 not and deal with matters of mental health, the church has to continue to do that. It's an intergenerational piece as well. Some of our forefathers said to, you know, they will always say things like, well, you know, this is not, um, um, you do as I, you do as I say, um, and not what I, and not necessarily what I do. But now we're in a climate where addressing mental health can no longer be a uh, baby boomer um, silence. We now are in a generation where these young people are not being silent about the conditions that they find themselves in. So the church needs to be a little bit more liberating in its access to information um, with some of the young people that we're dealing with. I just asked them, all of them said, 
I believe in God. I just don't even, I don't believe in the people that are promoting it. Um, so again, I had them to even go in and say, prove, talk to me about the proof that you have that God exists. So again, what, what I'm arguing is that the church has to be better. It needs to be a facility, a haven, a sanctuary um, for all issues to be addressed. And for people, trauma says you got to feel safe first before you go on to voice and choice. So again, I think that we have to become, while we're taking this reprieve, we have to become, we need to be able to fill our churches um, with and um, so that it is informed to meet the needs of people that are coming at this point. Johns Hopkins did a study that said during COVID, people between 18 to 30 um, have experienced higher levels of mental health at this particular time. Who are they going to go to? They don't trust the institutions um, that are psychiatrists. Sometimes they don't do that. But where are they going to go? The church has to ready itself to be able to deal with these issues and or find experts that can. So I want to propose this question to everybody. And I see the Q&A. Um, I see the Q&A question, Gregory. I'm, I'm going to get I'm going to get right back to it. Um, but I want to propose this question because because mental health and the, the dynamics that we're experiencing right now as a country are affecting people's mental health um, in ways that most of us can't even begin to comprehend. Um, how are you all specifically as faith based leaders addressing mental health, not just in your congregations, but in your communities with individuals that you encounter and when they know you as a faith based leader, how are you specifically going about addressing mental health. So we'll, we can start with we can start with Aaron. Well, <laughs> I think one of the issues, what well, I got to let me just couch it as best I can. Yeah. A lot of times pastors do not want to have someone else's voice on their sheet. So a lot of times, you know, they will talk against mental health um, as if counseling is not Bible. You know, there's safety in the multitude of counsel. <laughs> um, let this mind being you this also in Christ Jesus. So there's a transformative thinking that has to happen and it takes a certain level of counsel. But a lot of churches, you know, uh, pastors just don't feel comfortable with lending um, their parishioner or their sheep to another voice because they feel like it's going to be some other teaching or it's teaching that is contrary to the audience at hand. Um, but I really believe now for me, I've been talking about depression and anxiety um, a whole lot since the pandemic, um, particularly in the area of wealth, <clears throat> which is mammon um, as it relates to the anxiety thereof lacking wealth and lacking resources. And so uh, trying to dispel the relationship of mammon and God and trying to allow persons to be able to see that you have to be in relationship with God and not in relationship with mammon. And so mammon is money of evil influence or the anxiety of having lack um, and believing that there is no provision. And so I think a lot of times that we have to be able to have systems in our preaching and our teaching and our walk, um, how we have to be able to help them. So let's say if I can't give you all the counsel I need, I do know the areas in which the brother Isaiah was talking about. I do know the areas in which you need help in. So if it is you don't have food, let me help you in the area. If you don't have clothes, let me help you in the area. So you may not, you may not go to a clinical psychologist but me being a man of faith and being in touch and in tune with God, you may not be sitting on my, my lounge chair communicating with me, but I do know the areas in which you're hurting and I need to be able to help you um, to make better choices. And how do I do that? I feed you, I clothe you, I communicate with you um, to be that, that psychologist as best I can to answer some of the psychological, psychological entities of fear and issues in your life. Um, and so my, my part is that I make sure as best I can is to communicate um, um, the thought process of anxiety and depression during this time of COVID and to be able to get them out of that space and to be able to offer a certain level of service. So after I communicate with them, they understand that I'm trying to help them and to relieve them from anxiety and depression. Yeah. So Michael, I'm going to ask you the, the same question. How are you specifically addressing mental health? in your congregation, in your community? Uh, well, um, uh, as many of you might, not, might know or might not know, uh, I'm married to a mental health therapist. 
uh, who uh, really um, uh, help to shape and inform our work around that uh, in our congregation as well as our community. So for example, um, we have uh, uh, people being trained all the time uh, uh, through organizations like NAMI uh, within our congregation as a support and aid for people who are dealing uh, with mental health issues. Um, but from a spiritual uh, perspective, all healing comes from God. Uh, yeah. And this is something that we need to really understand. Um, and so whether, whether your healing is coming from uh, the preaching in the pulpit or your healing is coming from sitting in the therapist's office, getting what you need mentally, um, all healing comes from God. And that individual is a, is a resource, okay, is a resource that, that God can send into your life to help you for your mental well-being. Um, and so my, my job is to help you with your spiritual well-being, okay? And I can help you in that capacity as well as help you in your mental well-being by pairing you or partnering you or getting you connected with a resource that's going to help you to be able to do that. And we have that all over our church. I think I have more social workers, more licensed clinical social workers in my church than the Department of Social Work. I mean, they are everywhere all over our church. And, and that's how we support our community. And, and those are some of the services that we offer and provide uh, for individuals uh, that are in need. Uh, also, awareness is another um, uh, way that we're able to help and support of making people aware of making our own people uh, that there's nothing in getting support. Whether it, it is something deeper than that. Um, and uh, to Dr. Daniel's point, uh, I grew I'm not sure if you're just breaking up on my screen um, or if you're breaking up on everybody else's. Is, is everybody else getting the same thing? Yes. All right. So, hey, hey Mike, I don't know if you can hear me, but you're breaking up a bit. You, Sorry. There? I think I got kicked off. <laughs> All right. I think, I, I think I got kicked off. I don't know where y'all heard me left off, but uh, I was saying I, I grew up, you know, Pentecostal and back then, therapy wasn't even in the cards. <laughs> um, but when you know better, you do better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and we've come to a place of revelation and understanding that all healing comes from God. Uh, and these are, there are tools and resources that can help the total individual and the church should be a clearinghouse, a resource center hub for those type of things for people's lives. So you talked about a resource center and a hub. And I think that, um, one of the things that I've seen, particularly from Heber, and I want to get Heber in here because I know you were, you were working, brother. You were out there moving produce for our people. Um, <laughs> one of the things, and, and Dr. Daniels, don't, 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 don't be mad at me because I know you want to tap into that question of what you're doing about mental health. We're going to cycle back, I promise. Uh, but you already kind of addressed it a little bit when you were, when you were speaking initially. But when we talk about creating a development hub, a community development hub, a mental health space, a, a space for to address food insecurity that exists within our community, you're doing that, right? Um, and one of the things that I mentioned in your bio was community organizer. And so what I really want to know is, what does the title community organizer mean to you? And how have you, have a, as a community organizer, made impact specifically in the community? Oh, uh, thank y'all so much for the grace tonight. Um, as I really literally was just moving cucumbers and squash and potatoes, wow. uh, dropping some stuff off, picking up some, we buy from black farmers in the South and we truck it North to churches and businesses and communities to create our own, um, food value chain, a supply chain. We need to, you know, we talk about village a whole lot. Um, and I think I enjoy thinking about supporting that village systematically. How do you, how do you build, put the infrastructure in for this, bring it beyond, let's bring it to time when it's not lined up solely with um, an individual pastor's charisma. But, um, and I might be going in and out, so y'all let me know. My, my Wi-Fi acts up this time of night. But I'll say, in terms of community organizing, I think, you know, 
for me, it comes down to having a deep level of attentiveness and doing some deep listening around the needs of your community and, and being moved of God to bend your gene, your ability, your resources in the direction of addressing that need. If I was to give just a real simple definitional description, that's what it means to me. Um, and so I think to a degree, uh, every religious leader is a community organizer in some way, shape or form. All of us engage in organizing. A pastor gets a vision from God to do something. You better believe that there are people in the congregation who will not be convinced that the pastor heard from God. And so that pastor then will have to do some organizing in that congregation. Uh, and and, and every, every person knows on the screen exactly what I mean. Uh, sometimes you gotta, you gotta know who the, uh, the pew leaders are. You gotta know what personalities in the congregation are that will help get stuff done. And what, what are we doing? We're organizing. We're organizing. When we do that, we're organizing. And so uh, that's what it means to me. And so before my computer sets all the way down, I'll say that in the brand of ministry that God has blessed and wired me to do, and, and, I, and I love, I was hearing earlier somebody talking about the ways in which the people on the screen, we complement one another. So I don't feel pressure to be everything to everybody. There are some things I'm like, nah, you got to go talk to Bishop Daniels about that. Mental health? Yeah, uh-huh. Our, our church has launched a mental health initiative that I'm really excited about. But I'm just talking about, you know, when I think about the religious leaders across the, across the city, rather, I have certain files in my head as to who has a particular genius in that arena. And I'm grateful you know, it's a relief that I don't, I don't have to try to be everything. No, I can't tell you some of the members who came to me and said, Pastor Brown, thank you so much for everything. The, the church has been a blessing, but it's time for me to move on and I'm going to so-and-so's church. And I pray with the person say, praise God. Come on, let's pray about that. I want to make sure that you're transitioning your journey as well. Um, so in that same kind of spirit and the same thing, with my brother, Minister Carlos, student Minister Carlos Muhammad at Muhammad Mosque number six. Uh, dear brother, who I've been shoulder to shoulder with, with some time, for some time and, and continue to be inspired by our dear brother, brother Isaiah Muhammad and the wonderful work that he's been doing for some time. Uh, I will say too, black women are missing on this screen and we better be clear that for every church, every mosque and every community organization moving in Baltimore and across the country, it ain't moving without black women. Let's just tell the whole God's honest truth. Sure that <laughs> when I'm looking for some street team, I'm looking for some people who are ready to be some riders for ministry. Um, you know, no shade to the brothers. I know this is the boys and the men, but I just gotta also tip the hat to the black women who um who who whose leadership goes a long way even without the titles and even when they're discriminated against on gender, they show up and bless us with their gifts. I think that each of us um, can talk about dynamic women in our lives and the impact that they've made. I know personally, um, to some degree, the story of, of, of each of you in, in terms of the women in your lives who have made impact. Um, and I think that to some degree, some of you know the woman in my life who's made an immense amount of impact, Hebrew, you more specifically, I think, than anybody else. Um, and shout out to my mom because she's in the uh, attendee box right now and I love you. Um, and I want to also kind of because I talk to people about questions in the chat and for those of you who have yet to put your questions in the chat or use the Q&A box, please do. Uh, but my big brother Gregory Riddick is, is over there and he asked specifically when it came to mental health piece and talking about burnout that you guys experienced. Are you guys willing to be open and transparent about some of the things that you guys experience in the mental health space and burnout um, from, a, from a spirituality and a faith-based perspective? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I've, I've, had, I've, had, I've had therapists uh, over the years and um, it's been an amazing experience for me to go to therapy and uh, have somebody who is skilled 
uh, to, to help me to process some things and work through some different life stages in my journey. Um, my wife and I have been to therapy over the years. Uh, we've been blessed now to be married 16 years, and I'm so grateful um, for us being married. And there have been times and chapters in our journey where we needed to go to therapy. We had to go sit with somebody. Um, and it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. I will continue to always see that as an avenue for myself, for my own growth, for my journey. And to add to that, let me say quickly that another way that I uh, tend well to my mental health is through gardening, which is, has tremendous therapeutic benefits. It is through physical fitness. My sons and I uh, bike ride multiple times a week, and I found th that to be a very powerful thing, not just on the physical front, but just kind of mentally as well. And finally, it was such a relief for me to understand that pastor, being a pastor is one of the things that I do. It is not the totality of who I am. And it made, that made room in my mind and my spirit for me to explore other aspects of who God made me to be. That's why I'm doing this farming stuff. Um, I'm, I'm, I mean, got a whole lot of other stuff going on. But once I started to recognize that the totality of my identity is not pastoring, that also put a whole lot, moved a whole lot of pressure off my back um, and allowed me to dream about a life beyond pastoring. I can't say I'm going to pastor all my life. Uh, my grandfather did for most of his life. My dad is acting like he's going to do that and go ahead and push on in. But I tell dad all the time, dad, I love you and, you and grandpa. Y'all did it. I ain't doing that, bro. I'm telling you right now, my, I, my family on land down south. I bought, my grandfather sold me the family land in Virginia. There's a porch down there and some lemonade waiting for me. I'm going to wave at every car and sit on that porch all day and turn, turn the baton to the next. Because sometimes I think we hold on too long. I know yeah. this ain't, you know, that ain't the conversation, but those are some things that work for me, and uh, I have no problem sharing that. Yeah, but I think that what you just mentioned was, was real, because we talked about transparency as it relates to you all's experience with mental health. And I want to I also pass this to, to Pastor Daniels before we move, because not only are you a pastor, a bishop, which means that you, um, that you oversee you know, the ministry of other, other pastors, right? You, you kind of give them spiritual guidance. You, you, you make sure that they're good. But you also are a licensed uh, clinician, right? And so we know sometimes people who work in the human service industry don't abide by the human service guidance, right? So how do you, how do you or I would say, would you be transparent in your mental health experience um, as both a pastor and as a clinician? Well, I mean, you know, I know we're not supposed to use this word um, in, in our field because it's, it's not professional. Um, but to some extent, you almost have to be crazy in order to be able to um, um, to, to be able to do the work, so to speak, um, <laughs> or you or you have some kind of background. We're not supposed to use that word, um, but but I think that um, um, because of compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma, um, being in the lives of people, um, um, you know, again, growing up in Baltimore City. That's what led me to the field of social work um, because there was no outlet um, for us to have conversation. We always had to play. We always had to be this public figure or I watched people be public figures and there was never a conversation about um, the kind of religious problem, spiritual problem, um, combined religious, spiritual problems. And then what I started to see down through the years, and this is what I teach um, a master level students, um, the overlap of spiritual, religious problems coupled with disorders. When they move beyond the continuum, and even for myself, um, there have been multiple times when the stress of ministry, the stress of vocation, the stress of life, um, and we are taught as social workers self-care. And far too often, um, we don't provide the same kind of self-care that we're asking other people to do. Multiple times in my life where I had to go sit with somebody, talk with them, um, and, and just get centered again. Because vicarious trauma says you literally take on, uh, most of you know this, but you take on um, the indirectly um, 
the, the pain, the suffering, and the, and the issues of people that you're working with. And there have been multiple times, also with compassion fatigue, it is fatiguing to continue to do things for sometimes people that what we call a culture of users, um, so to speak. Even though we highlight them, we lift them, our job is to constantly do that. Um, but again, there is those moments when there is a dearth, when there is a moment um, that you're just in a hole. And I've been there several times um, and also had to use talk therapy and everybody else's therapy in order to come out of that. Um, again, a lot of us are not being honest about this moment with COVID. Our whole, everything that we've come to know to some extent has been disrupted. Pastors, we still are not talking about it and saying we have been, dis people have been disrupted. We don't even know if our way of life will go back to um, where we were. Of course we will, but, but for the moment, because of loneliness, isolation, and all of those things, we have really seen um, a, a, what we call a mental health continuum right now. Multiple people, multiple people are experienced religious, spiritual dis disorders and disorders coupled together. Um, and it's a point, whether that's substance abuse, psychotic disorder, mood disorder, disassociative, obsessive compulsive, mm. all of that, personality disorders. We have seen it among the clergy. And being a licensed professional, I've had to talk with clergy. Uh, clergy, you wouldn't even imagine um, that it's just their, um, the weight of ministry and life has mm. compiled. So I want to shift back, because for those of you who don't understand clergy, clergy is... The, the, the gambit of individuals who work in ministry and have a title as a pastor or a reverend, um, that, that, is, that encompasses, you know, clergy. Um, but I want to shift back to the, the people, to the community, because each and every one of you here does community work. And each and every one of you in your process of doing community work is encountering what we're all experiencing, right? Some of you encountered it beforehand. Some of you have been in the community. Well, all of you have actually been in the community prior to COVID. And now you're in the community while COVID is happening right now. So I want to really speak about how we always talk about taking the church outside of the walls, right? And I think that some, to some degree, it's become more of a narrative than it has been an action. But for those of you who um, it is an action for, what does community engagement look like for you as a faith-based or spiritual leader. I'm going to start with uh, Pastor Hannah, then I'm going to move to uh, Brother Isaiah, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll circle back. I just want to mix up the conversation. So Pastor Hannah, if you would, what does community engagement uh, mm. look like for you? It's a lot of, lot of ways for it to look, but when you think of engagement, a lot of times you think of marriage. When you think about a man getting on one knee um, and giving his right to be the largest portion of the ring or the part of the ring that has the most value. Um, I think a lot of times for me, I, when I look to engage, I look to not just engage and have a moment, but I look to marry the community. I look to <laughs> engage with you to be able to present um, the valuable part of what I have and to give that to you. Um, and if I give you that which is valuable, you will, valuable, you will appreciate it. And then when I say, let's make a move, um, you'll do such because we are in relationship. And so the things that you may not understand, you'll trust because I've given you my valuables. I think when we do community, we gotta make sure that when we're doing community, that we're giving our very, very best um, um, of what we have and be being able to give what we have as our very best, meaning, is that sometimes when doing community, we give the persons that are in the community the scraps or the leftovers of what we have from our exhaustion. But I think the pandemic has shifted a lot of people to make uh, the community the thing that we give our valuables to. So I, along with these other persons, I believe we've given our valuables, but there are persons now that are now giving the valuables because that's all they really have at this point is community. They don't have the full wall, so they have to go out and be able to launch out into the deep and then put the net out. But I think that bait, that thing, we have to be able to, to, to in order for them to get them to hear us concerning mental health, 
to be able to get them to hear us about financial wealth, uh, to be able to get them to hear us in so many other areas of life. We must engage to be able to develop a marriage with our community. And that's what we've been doing. Every Prior to the pandemic, we were out every second and fourth Saturday with food and clothes. Um, uh, during the winter months from November to February, I do something called One Wednesdays where we feed uh, 125, 150 people um, every Wednesday. And then every second, uh, every third um, uh, Tuesday of the month, we do something called Family Feast where we feed um, everyone after Bible study. And so community is what it is that we do. Um, community is what it is that we're, we're called to and also the marketplace. And so uh, that's what, we, what we've been doing. Understood. Isaiah, community engagement. What what is what is that what does that look like to you? Well, first and foremost, you gotta look at the difference between a house of God and the house of God. See the definite R almost period the A. See a church. Ah. I see you were about to drop some knowledge, but I think you, 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 you uh, your service uh, is trying can to. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I got you now. How about, how about you got me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I was saying about the house of God being us. So if we understand that the places of worship are just buildings without us inside of them, we understand and we say something in Islam that if the mountain won't come to Muhammad, I mean, if, if, yeah, if the mountain don't come to Muhammad, then Muhammad has to go to the mountain. Or what about the parable when Jesus spoke about the man having a dinner and he sent somebody out to go get the doctors and the lawyers and the high-esteemed people and they wouldn't come. So he said, going to the highways and the byways. Yeah. And then brought the people that the ones don't think much of, the lower ones, the homeless, mm -hmm. the quote-unquote junkies the quote-unquote crash is the one that people think don't have lowest of our people because they don't need God. They don't need Jesus. They don't need religion. So we have to go to our people and go into the community. And then we always say, look at that word community. The main word inside of community is unity. First three letters of unity is you and I. So we have to come together, you and I, to go out there and show our people out there and just keep spitting scriptures if we don't make it real to our people. It's not going to do it if we go tell him to come to a building. Come to a building to do what? We need to go out there with our people, raise their conscious level, and let them know that the building is just part of a bigger plan and a bigger situation. So it shows that we have to go up amongst our people instead of trying to put them in a building just to say that they're part of a a clergy or part of a, you know, mosque or church, we have to understand and go amongst our people and bring them in and show them better instead of just talking. Absolutely. Dr. Daniels, what does community engagement look like to you? Well, it's it, for me, um, I, I'm, I'm working with a group of um, PhD students now, about seven of them. Um, and that's what we're talking about, urban communities and organization. Community engagement uh, literally means building long, term relationships mm. um, with people in community that is both beneficial um, and both sacrificial and committal. Um, meaning mm. these relationships occur over time. Um, and I can go back, I can pinpoint them, and we build relationships, but then not only do we build um, relationships together, but we also build power together and then we not also build, we not just build power, we develop and organize um, together as well. So community engagement brings long standing relationships, coalitional relationships, um, all of that. And you and I have a legacy, a historical le legacy, nine eras in the, in the country, in the United States, colonialization, revolution, expansion, um, Civil War, industrialization, progressive era, Great Depression. We have a legacy of men and women that were the Free African Society, the Brothers of Liberty, the Goon Squad, the Civil Rights Era, um, Marcus Garvey, the, the Brothers of the Sleeping Porters, the Nation of Islam, Amos Wilson. We have a legacy of people 
that commune together, engage so that we can have power even to this day. So when you talk to me about community engagement, I'm looking at it ancestrally. I'm looking at from a contemporary standpoint, we've had people to go forth from us um, that have not only engaged the community, but built the community in times of turmoil and crisis. We have no excuse. We are insane at this point. Um, if we continue not to do what's been bequeathed to us by our ancestors. So um, it's ironic, right? Um, I mean, you talk about the ancestors and I, I got to, like I was on a call two weeks ago with my brother Muhammad uh, from Keys Development and we were on a call with the Indian diaspora of America and the call was beautiful. And right before we got off the call, the guy basically asked a question. I'm gonna paraphrase this question, but his, his question led to why don't black people have an affinity for education? Why is it that we, like other people coming to America, don't utilize education as a system of social mobility? And I understand that I have two individuals. I know that some of y'all are probably feeling the way that I'm feeling uh, or felt when he asked that question. But I know that I have two individuals right now who are huge advocates for um, education. Um, and you guys are both in the process of, well, Hebrew, you've already started your school. Um, Mike, I know that you have a, a, a huge heart for education. So if you two could really address, right, what role does education play, right? What, what, what role does church, spirituality, I won't even say church, spirituality, faith and education play in us progressing our communities and impacting life outcomes for boys and young men of color? Um, first of all, I'm so glad you switched it up and didn't make me follow Dr. Daniel's answer to community engagement because he just killed that. <laughs> so I'm so glad I diverted to try to follow that up, okay? <laughs> um, but um, I, I think it's a trifecta. I think it is, it is the holy trinity of, of community development, if you will. Uh, education, uh, to me, uh, is, is the solution to 10,000 problems, okay? Uh, it is the solution to 10,000 problems within our community. And the reason why um, it is not uh, um, uplifted the way that it could be uh, is because it's not always accessible as it should be. Uh, the American education system as we know it, it really wasn't designed to educate all kids. And I'm not just talking about children of color. I'm talking about it wasn't designed to educate all kids from its very premise and foundation. So not to go back to all of that history, but that is the history of education that we took this German model uh, to create individuals who will be able to take industrialized jobs and do repetitive work. And so education wasn't built to unlock your potential, which is the very etymology of the word, to lead out, not to pour in. And so each child that's in the classroom, each individual that's being taught by a teacher is supposed to be in that classroom so that they can learn that they have something on the inside and we're trying to pull it out so they can go and fulfill the purpose God's given them. And so this is why I've made significant investment in education. First investment was literally giving up our building, that beautiful 158,000 square foot piece of property sitting on 125 North Hilton Street, which is now Green Street Academy. Um, our church literally um, sold that building into the community, which is community engagement by listening and allowing them to be the experts of what they needed for the community and they needed a school. And so the two wonderful founders of that school, uh, Dave Warnock and Larry Rivets, um, so fit to come and now they're there and it's their building, it's their space. It is, it is the community's building. Uh, we just, we just get to have church there sometimes. <laughs> okay. So, um, but they, they have it. And now that is an anchor institution, uh, along with the church, uh, that is housed there, uh, within that community. I'm doubling down on that effort, uh, by starting life prep, uh, which you were alluding to earlier. And so I'm in the process of starting a network of schools in West Baltimore, because to me, that is the key. If we can invest in education, 
if we can create high quality schools so that our kids are not trapped in low performing schools because of their zip code, okay, and that we can offer that in our community so that they don't have to have a mentality that I have to get up and get out, but I can get in and serve my community and continue to build it up with my gifts and talents, then we'll be on the right pathway to creating what we all want to have. Thank you so much. I, I think that, you know, what you're doing is extremely admirable. And I, I know you have a huge heart for education and even serving on the Maryland State Board of Education. Um, it's just great to know that you're there, but specifically with the mentality and the perspective that you have for our people, we know that we have an advocate sitting at that table. Um, Heber, you in starting your school kind of addressed something that Dr. Daniel said that Mike said that he didn't want to follow a moment ago, right? <laughs> is our history, right? And you started your school specifically so that, and, and I, would, I, would, I would assume, right, that we understand that the education system as it stands has done a really, really good job of eliminating our history from education. But you chose intentionally to start a school so that kids would understand our roots. So talk to us a little bit more about why uh, you chose to do that. And I'm, I'm assuming that, you know, it's, it's a read across freedom school. So I imagine that the cross has some spiritual uh, context to it. Um, so tell us about where you believe that education, spirituality, faith intersect. I, I think that is very important that we reflect and sit with what uh, Pastor Phillips just said about uh, um, his critique and in, in the current education system. Um, that system creates a pipeline for many of our children to go straight to prison or a conveyor belt to hopelessness, despair. Uh, I, and I think it's important 